Since his return from Moscow, His Majesty had been devoting himself with unparalleled activity to the means to be taken for preventing the invasion of the Russians, who, having joined the Prussians since the defection of General York, were forming a most formidable mass. New levies had been decreed, and during two months there had been received and utilized innumerable offers of horses and riders made by all the cities of the Empire administration's rich individuals nearly connected with the court. ETC, the Imperial Guard, was reorganized by the brave Duke de Friol, who was the last to be taken away from his numerous friends a few months later amidst these serious occupations. His Majesty did not lose sight of his favorite plan, that of making Paris the most beautiful city of the world. Not a week passed without architects and engineers being admitted to present him with their designs, make their reports easy to say. It is a shame, the Emperor said one day to Monsieur Fontaine while looking at the barracks of the guard. A sort of black and smoky outhouse. It is a shame to construct buildings as frightful as those of Moscow. I ought never to have allowed such work to be done. Are you not my first architect? Thereupon, Mr. Fontaine excused himself by calling His Majesty's attention to the fact that he had nothing to do with the construction of Paris, that he had indeed the honor of being the Emperor's first architect, but merely for the Tuileries and the Louvre. That is true, replied His Majesty. But could there not be constructed in place of that wooden dockyard, which makes a frightful effect here, pointing to the quay, a hotel for the Italian minister? Monsieur Fontaine replied that the thing was very feasible, but would cost between two and three, four millions. Whereupon the emperor seemed to abandon that idea, and thinking of the Tuileries Garden, possibly on account of General Mallet's conspiracy, he told him to arrange all the fastenings of the palace in such a way that one key would answer for all the locks. This key, added his majesty, must be remitted to the Grand Marshal every evening after the doors are closed. Some days after this conversation with Monsieur Fontaine, the emperor sent to him for himself and Monsieur Costaz. The subjoined note, a copy of which has fallen into my hands. His Majesty had gone that morning to examine the buildings at Chaillot. There will be a time to discuss the construction of the palace of the King of Rome. I am unwilling to be dragged into foolish expenses. I want a palace smaller than that of St. Cloud and larger than that of Luxembourg. I want to be able to live in it by the time the 16th million shall have been expended. That would be a medium which I could enjoy if instead of this pretentious things are made for me. It will be as if as it is with the Louvre, which has never been completed. You will have to begin with the plantations, determine the space to be enclosed, and enclose it. I want this palace to be a little finer than that of the Elysee. Now, the Elysee did not cost eight millions to build, and yet it is one of the finest palaces in Paris. That of the King of Rome will be the second palace after the Louvre, which is a large palace. It will be, so to say, merely a country seat for Paris for people will always prefer to spend the winter at the Louvre or the Tuileries. I find difficulty in believing that it costs $16 million to build St. Clou. Before seeing the plan, I wish to have it well discussed and settled by the building committee so that I shall have the assurance that the sum of $16 millions will not be surpassed. I do not want a chimera, but a real thing for me and not for the amusement of the architect. The completion of the Louvre will be enough for his fame. When the plan is once adopted, I will carry it forward very fast. The Elysee does not please me, and the Tuileries are uninhabitable. Nothing can please me unless it is extremely simple and built in accordance with my tastes and manner of life. Then this palace will be useful to me. I would like to have it a more substantial sans souci. I especially desire to have it an agreeable palace rather than a fine garden to conditions which are incompatible. That it should be between court and garden like the Tuileries that from my apartment I can go and promenade in the garden and park as at St. Clou. But at St. Clou there is the inconvenience of having no park for the house. The exposure must be studied also in order that my apartment shall 
get a light to north and south so that I can change my room according to the temperature. My dwelling room must be that of a rich private individual like that of my small apartment at Fontainebleau. My apartment must be very near that of the Empress and on the same floor. In fine, I must have a convalescence palace or habitation for a man in the decline of life. I want a small theater. A small chapel, ETC. And above all, take care that there is no stagnant water around the palace. The taste for building was at this time pushed to excess by the emperor. He was like a more active architect, one more in haste to execute his plans, more jealous of his ideas than all the architects in the world. And still, the notion of putting the palace of the king of Rome on the heights of Chio was not altogether his. Mr. Fontaine might claim the better part of it on the first occasion mentioned had been made of the Palace of Lyon, which, to have a fine appearance, said Mr. Fontaine, needed to be situated on an eminence that might dominate the city. As, for example, the heights of Chaillot dominate Paris. The emperor did not seem to notice what Mr. Fontaine had just said. Two or three days before, he had given orders to have the Chateau of Meudon put into condition to receive his son. But one morning, he summoned the architect and told him to prepare a plan for the embellishment of the Bois de Bologna, adding to it a pleasure house built on top of the Mount Chaillot. What do you think of it? He added, smiling. Do you think the site well chosen? One morning in March, the emperor had his son taken to a grand review held in the Champ de Mars. There was an indescribable enthusiasm, the sincerity of which could not be doubted, for it was easy to see that the shouts proceeded from the heart. Hence, the emperor was much affected by it. He re-entered the Tuileries in the most charming mood. He caressed the king of Rome, covered him with kisses, calling Mr. Fontaine's attention and mind to the precocious intelligence displayed by this dear child. He was not afraid of anything, said his majesty. He seemed to know that all those brave fellows were acquaintances of mine. That day, he chatted for a long time with Monsieur Fontaine, playing, meanwhile, with his son, whom he held in his arms, the conversation happening to turn on Rome. Monsieur Fontaine spoke of the Pantheon with the most profound admiration. The emperor asked whether he had ever lived in Rome, and on Monsieur Fontaine's replying that when he went there first, he remained three years. It is a city I have not seen, continued his majesty. I will surely go there some day. It is the city of the king's people. And as he said it, his eyes were fixed upon the king of Rome with all the pride of paternal tenderness. When Mr. Fontaine had departed, the emperor made a sign for me to approach and began by pulling my ears, as was his habit, when in good humor, after some personal questions, he asked me what my salary was. Sire, 6,000 francs. And Mr. Collin, how much has he? 12,000 francs. 12,000 francs? That is not just. You ought not to have less than Mr. Collin. I will see about that. His majesty did, in fact half the kindness to make inquiries at once. But he was told that the accounts of the year were made, whereupon the emperor told me that until the end of the year, it would be Baron Fink, who would give me 500 francs monthly out of his privy purse, wishing. So he said that my salary should equal that of Mr. Colomb. Chapter 5. Since the time when the emperor quitted the army, leaving, as the reader knows, the command to the king of Naples, his Sicilian majesty had likewise abandoned the authority conferred on him, remitting it to Prince Eugène when he departed to his own dominions. The emperor was very eager for the news he received from Posen, where the grand headquarters were toward the end of February and the beginning of March, but the prince, vice right, had little under his command but the debris of different corps, some of which were no longer represented save by a very small number of men. Moreover, all that he could do whenever the Russians presented themselves in force was to retreat, and every day of March brought news 
which constantly grew more disquieting. Hence, toward the end of the month, the emperor decided to depart for the army very soon. Long preoccupied with the attempt Malay had made during his last absence, the emperor had already expressed himself on the danger of leaving his government without a head, and the journals had been filled with inquiries concerning the ceremonies in use when, in former times, the regency of the kingdom had been entrusted to the queens. As this was generally known to be the means frequently adopted by his majesty in order to foster opinion in advance considering what he intended to do. No one was surprised to find him conferring the regency on the Empress Marie Louise before his departure. Circumstances not yet permitting him to have her crowned as he had long desired. The Empress took the solemn oath at the Elysee Palace in presence of the Prince's great dignitaries and ministers. The Duke de Cador was appointed secretary of the regency to advise her majesty in concert with the arch chancellor. The command of the guard was in Trusted to Channel Caffarelli. The emperor started from St. Clou April 15th at 4 o'clock in the morning. He entered Mayence at midnight the next day. On arriving, His Majesty learned that Erfurt and all of Westphalia were prey to the most vivid alarms. Nothing could express the rapidity which this tidings imparted to this march. In eight hours, he was at Erfurt. His Majesty did not stop long in that city. The information he received there tranquilized him completely concerning the results of the campaign. On leaving Erfurt, the emperor wished to pass through Weimar to salute the Grand Duchess. He paid his visit the same day, an hour that the emperor Alexander went from Dresden to Toplitz to see the other Duchess of Weimar, the hereditary princess's sister. The Grand Duchess received the emperor with a grace that enchanted him. Their interview lasted for nearly an hour. On quitting her, his majesty said to the prince, of Neuchatel. That woman is always astonishing. Really, she has the head of a great man. The Duke accompanied the Emperor to the market town of Eckhartsburga, where His Majesty kept him to dinner with them. The Emperor was quartered on the Place de Eckhartsburga. He had only two rooms. His suite camped on the landing and the staircase. Nothing could be more extraordinary than the aspect of this little town, thus transformed for some hours into headquarters. Across a square, surrounded by camps, bivouacs, and parks of artillery. Amidst more than a thousand vehicles which crossed, got mixed up with, and entangled in each other in every way, you saw regiments slowly defiling convoys, trains of artillery, baggage wagons, etc. Behind these came herds of cattle, preceded or cut into by little carts of settlers and canteen women, equipages so light that frail, that the least shock damaged them, and then marauders with their plunder, peasants forced into driving the vehicles, and cursing and swearing to the accompaniment of the laughter of our soldiers and couriers, orderlies, aides de camp, darting at a gallop through this curiously diversified and motley multitude of men and beasts. And if this to you, Add this to the whinnying of the horses, the lowing of the cattle, the noise of wheels upon the pavement, the cries of soldiers, the trumpets, the drums, the bands, the complaints of the inhabitants, 400 persons all asking the same thing at the same time, talking German to Italians, French to Germans. How will you ever comprehend that it was impossible for His Majesty to be as tranquil, as entirely at his ease in the midst of this infernal racket as if he were in his cabinet at the Tuileries or St. Cloud? Yet... So it was. The emperor seated before a wretched table covered with a sort of cloth, a map under his eyes, compass and pen in hand, wrapped in his meditations, showed not the least impatience. One might have thought that not a sound of the exterior din had reached his ears, but let a cry of pain arise from any quarter. And on the instant, the emperor would raise his head and order someone to go and find out what happened the power of isolating oneself so completely from all that is going on around us is very difficult to acquire no one in the world has possessed it like his majesty may 1st the emperor was at Lutzen. the battle was not fought until the next day on that day about six o'clock in the evening the brave marshal bessier duke de street was carried off by a cannonball at the moment when mounted on a height, wrapped in a long cloak, which he had put on to escape notice, he had just ordered the burial of the brigadier of his escort, whom a first ball had killed, but a few paces away from him. The Duke d'Istri 
had seldom quitted the emperor since the first Italian campaign. He had followed him everywhere, had been present at all his battles, and always distinguished himself by a courage equal to every trial and an uprightness and candor too rare among the great personages by whom his majesty was surrounded. He had passed through nearly every grade of the command of the imperial guard and his wide experience, his excellent qualities, his good heart, and his unalterable attachment had greatly endeared him to his majesty. The emperor was deeply affected on learning the marshal's death. For several moments, he remained silent, his head bent, and his eyes fixed upon the ground. At last, said he, he has died the death of Turin. His fate is to be envied. Then he passed his hand across his eyes and precipitately left the place. The body of the marshal was embalmed and taken to Paris. The emperor wrote the following letter to Madame the Duchess Distri, my cousin, your husband is dead on the field of honor. The loss that you and your children have sustained is doubtless great, but mine is yet more so. The Duke Distri died the most beautiful of deaths and without suffering. He leaves a reputation without a spot. It is the finest heritage he could have bequeathed on his children. My protection is assured to them. They will inherit also the affection that I bore their father. Find in all these considerations some consoling motives to alleviate your sorrows and never doubt my sentiments towards you. This letter having no other purpose, I pray God, my cousin, that he may have you in his safe and holy keeping, Napoleon. The king of Saxony erected a monument to the Duc d'Istri on the spot where he fell. The victory long disputed in this battle of Lutzen was all the more glorious for the emperor. On that account, it was principally the young conscripts who gained it. They fought like lions. Marshal Ney expected this moreover, for before the battle, he said to his majesty, Sire, give me plenty of those little young fellows yonder. I will lead them wherever I please. The old moustaches know as much as we do. They reflect. They have too much sang fra. But those intrepid children do not know the difficulties. They always look straight ahead, never to right or left. In the middle of the fight, the Prussians, commanded by the king in person, did in fact make so furious an assault on the marshal's corps that it recoiled, but the conscripts did not take to flight. They awaited the blows, rallied by platoons, and thus turned round the enemy while shouting, Long live the emperor! With all their might, the Emperor made his appearance, and recovering from the terrible shock they had sustained, and electrified by the presence of the hero, they attacked in their turn with incomparable violence. His Majesty was surprised by it. I have been commanding French armies for twenty years, said he, and I never before saw such bravery and devotion. You should have seen those young soldiers, wounded, one deprived of an arm, another of a leg, and with but a breath of life remaining, trying to rise up from the ground as the Emperor approached and shouting, Long live the Emperor! With all the voice they had left. Tears come to my eyes when I think of those lads so brilliant, so strong, and so courageous. There was the same bravery, the same enthusiasm on the part of our enemies. The chasseurs of the Prussian guard were nearly all young men who were under fire for the first time. They sprang to meet death and fell by hundreds before they gave way a foot. In no battle, I think, did the emperor seem more visibly protected by his destiny. Balls whistled past his ears. As they went by, they carried off scraps from the harness of his horse. Balls and grenades rolled to his feet. Nothing touched him. The men saw all this, and their enthusiasm was redoubled. At the commencement of the battle, the emperor saw a battalion advancing, whose chief had been suspended from his functions two or three days before, for a rather trifling fault of discipline, the poor officer was marching the second rank of his soldiers, by whom he was adored. Perceiving him, the emperor halted the battalion, took the officer by the hand, and put him back at the head of his troop. The effect produced by this scene cannot be described. May 8, at 7 o'clock in the evening, the emperor made his entry to Dresden and took possession of the palace which the emperor of Russia and the king of Prussia had quitted that very morning. At some distance from the barriers, the emperor was saluted by a deputation from the municipality of the city. You deserve, said he to the ambassadors, that I should treat you as a conquered country. I know all that you have been doing while the allies occupied your city. I have the list of volunteers whom you have clothed, equipped, and armed against me with a liberality that astonished even the enemy. I know what insults you have heaped on France and how many infamous libels you have 
had to hide or burn today. I am not ignorant of your noisy transports of joy. When the Emperor of Russia and the King of Prussia answered within your walls, your houses are still decked with garlands, and we yet see on your pavement the flowers which your young girls scattered along their path. Yet I will pardon all. Thank your king, for it is he who has saved you, and I pardon only through love of him. Let a deputation from among you go and beg him to restore you his presence. My aide de camp, General Durisnell, will be your governor. Your good king himself would not choose a better. At the moment of entering the city, the emperor learned that a part of the Russian rear guard was trying to keep a foothold in the new city, separated by the Alp from the old one which had fallen into our hands. His majesty at once ordered that everything should be done to drive out these remaining troops, and during an entire day, there was constant cannonading and firing in the city from one bank to the other. Balls and grenades fell like hail on the ground, occupied by the emperor. Close behind him, a grenade broke the partition wall of a powder magazine and hurled the fragments at his head. Happily, the fire did not reach the powder. A few minutes afterwards, another grenade fell between his majesty and several Italians. They stooped down to avoid the effect of the explosions. The emperor saw this movement and, beginning to laugh, he said to them, Nonsense, that doesn't do any harm. May 11. In the morning, the Russians were flying in pursuit, and the French army entered into all parts of the city. The emperor stayed all day long on the bridge, watching the troops file by. At 10 o'clock next day, the Imperial Guard took arms and put itself in battle array. On the road from Pirna to Grogarten, the emperor reviewed them and sent General Flatto forward. The King of Saxony arrived about noon. On meeting, the two sovereigns dismounted from their horses and embraced each other. They afterwards entered Dresden amidst universal acclamations. General Flatto, who had gone to meet the King of Saxony with a portion of the Imperial Guard, received most flattering tokens of satisfaction and gratitude from this good king. No one could display more good manners." More good nature, more gentleness than the king of Saxony. The emperor said of him and his family that it was a patriarchal family and that all the members of it united to great virtues and expansive goodness that should make them adored by their subjects. His majesty always paid the most affectionate attentions to this royal personage. So long as the war lasted, he sent couriers daily to acquaint the king with the slightest circumstances. He came himself as often as he could in fine with him. He was always full of that amiability he knew so well how to assume and to render irresistible when he chose. Several days after his arrival in Dresden, His Majesty had a long conversation with the King of Saxony, which turned chiefly upon the Emperor Alexander. The qualities and defects of that prince were amply analyzed, and the result arrived at once that the Emperor Alexander had been sincere effort and that very complicated intrigues had been required to bring about this rupture of all bonds of amity. Sovereigns are so unfortunate, said his majesty, always circumvented, always surrounded by flatterers or faithless counselors, whose first necessity is to prevent the truth from reaching the ears of their master, whom it so greatly concerns to know it. Afterwards, the two sovereigns began to talk about the Emperor of Austria. His Majesty seemed profoundly afflicted that his union with the Archduchess Marie Louise, whom he had done everything in the world to render happy, should not have had the result he hoped for, that of gaining him the confidence and friendship of his father-in-law. But... I was not born a sovereign, said the emperor. Perhaps that accounts for it. And yet I should have thought this circumstance would have been an additional title to the friendship of Francis. Never, I am sure, could I have persuaded myself that such ties would not be strong enough to retain the emperor of Austria in my alliance. For after all, I am his son-in-law. My son is his grandson. He loves his daughter. She is happy. How then can he be my enemy? On hearing of the victory of Lutzen and the entry into Dresden, the Emperor of Austria made haste to dispatch Mr. de Bubna to his son-in-law. He arrived the evening of the 16th, and the interview he at once obtained from His Majesty lasted until two hours after midnight. That 
giving us hopes that peace would soon be made. We formed a thousand conjectures, one more reassuring than the other, but two or three days elapsed during which we saw nothing but preparations for war, which cruelly undeceived us. It was then that I heard these words issued from the mouth of the unfortunate Marshal de Rock. This is lasting too long. We shall all die at it. He had the presentiment of his death. Throughout the entire campaign, the emperor had not an instant of repose. The days slipped by in combats or excursions, always on horseback. The night in cabinet work, I have never comprehended how his body could resist such fatigues. And yet he enjoyed almost un interrupted good health the eve of the battle of bouts and he went to bed very late after having visited all the military posts at the orders after the orders were given he slept profoundly may 20 20th the day of the battle the evolutions began at daybreak and at headquarters we awaited the result with keen impatience but the battle was not to end that day after a succession of combats all to our advantage Though bitterly disputed, the emperor returned to headquarters at nine o'clock in the evening, took the slight repast, and remained with Prince Bertier until midnight. The rest of the night was spent in work, and at five o'clock in the morning, the emperor was up and ready for the fright. Two or three hours after his arrival on the battlefield, the emperor could not resist the slumber that overcame him for seeing the issue of the day. He fell asleep on the slope of a ravine amidst the batteries of the Duke de Ragusa. They awoke him to say that the battle was won. This fact, which he related to me in the evening, did not amaze me, for I had already remarked that when he was obliged to yield to slumber, that imperious necessity of nature, the emperor took the repose essential to him how and where he could, like a true soldier. Although the battle was decided, yet the fighting went on until five o'clock in the evening. At six o'clock, the emperor had his tent set up near an isolated tavern which had served as the headquarters of the emperor Alexander the two preceding days. I received orders to go thither, and I hastened to do so, but his majesty passed that night also. In receiving and congratulating the principal chiefs, as well as in working with the secretaries, all the wounded who were able to walk were already marching on the road to Dresden, where ample assistance awaited them. But on the field of battle lay more than 10,000 men, French, Russians, Prussians, ETC, scarcely breathing, mutilated, and in a piteous condition. The efforts of the good and indefatigable Baron Larry and a multitude of surgeons encouraged by his heroic example did not suffice even for the first dressings. And what means of transportation for these poor wretches could be found on this desolate plain, all of whose villages had been sacked and burned where there no longer remain either carriages or horses? Must all these men be left to perish in the most atrocious anguish for lack of means to carry them to Dresden? Then it was that this population of Saxon villagers who must have been embittered by the disasters of war, who beheld their dwellings burn, their fields ravages, willingly afforded to the whole army the spectacle of what pity can inspire, of what is most sublime in the heart of man. They perceived the cruel anxieties of Mr. Larry and his companions concerning the fate of so many unfortunate wounded. In an instant, men, women, children, old people ran up with wheelbarrows, and the wounded were raised, placed on these frail vehicles. Two or three persons took hold of each wheelbarrow and conducted them to dress it in this way, stopping whenever, by cry or sigh, the wounded soldier asked to rest, stopping to replace the bandages and disarranged by the movement and stopping near a spring to give him a drink and a light. Thus, the fever that devoured him. I have never seen anything so touching. Baron Larry had a very lively dispute with the emperor. Among the wounded, a great number of young soldiers had been found with two fingers of the right hand shattered. His majesty believed that these poor young fellows had done it expressly to dispense themselves from service. He said so to Mr. Larry, who hotly denied it saying that it was impossible that such cowardliness was not in the character of these brave conscripts. As the emperor insisted, Mr. Larry went so far as to tax him with injustice. Things had arrived at this point when certain proof was supplied that these uniform wounds were all caused by the precipitation with which the young soldiers charged and discharged their guns, to the handling of which they were not accustomed. Then his majesty saw that Mr. Larry had been in the right and was grateful to him for his firmness in maintaining what he knew to be true. 
You are a thoroughly good man, Mr. Larry, said the emperor. I wish I were surrounded with none but men like you. But men like you are very rare. Chapter 6. We were on the eve of the day when the emperor, still deeply affected by the loss he had sustained in the person of the Duke de Street, was to receive the blow that he probably felt more than all others inflicted by the sight of his old companions in arms falling at his side. The very next day after the sort of dispute I have recorded in the previous chapter between the emperor and Baron Larry was signalized by the irreparable loss of the excellent Marshal Duroc. The emperor's heart was broken by it, and there was not one of us who did not shed honest tears for him. So just and good was he. Although grave and severe with all who were brought into contact with him by the nature of their duties, this was a loss, not merely to the emperor who possessed in him a real friend, but I venture to say that it was one to all France, which he passionately adored, and for which he never ceased to lavish his counsels, although they were not always listened to. The death of Marshal Duroc was one of those events which are so painful and so unexpected that one hesitates to credit them, even when a too evident reality no longer permits one to cherish the least illusion. These are the circumstances in which this baleful event came to spread consternation throughout the army. The emperor was pursuing the Russian guard, which constantly escaped him. It had just done so for perhaps the tenth time since morning after having killed and made prisoners of a good number of our men when two or three cannonballs which plowed up the ground at his feet attracted the emperor's attention and made him say what no result after such butchery no prisoners these fellows will not leave me a pin Hardly had he spoken when a ball passed and upset a mounted chest, sir, of the escort, almost between the legs of his majesty's horse. Ah, to rock, said he, turning to the grand marshal. Fortune has a heavy grudge against us today. Sire, said he to camp, who came up at a gallop. General Briere has just been killed. My poor comrade of Italy, is it possible? Ah, oh, we must get through this all the same. And seeing on his left an eminence from whose summit he could observe better what was going on the emperor turned in that direction through a cloud of dust the duke de vicenza the duke de trevise marshal de roc and general of engineers curguenay followed his majesty very closely but the wind blew the smoke and dust so violently that one could hardly see a tree near which the emperor was passing was suddenly struck by a cannonball which half destroyed it his majesty having reached level ground turned to ask for his glass and saw no one but the duke de vicenza Duke Charles de Plaisance came up. A deadly pallor overspread his countenance. He bent toward the grand equerry and said a few words in his ear. What is the matter? Quickly demanded the emperor. What has happened? Sire, said the Duke de Plaisance, weeping. The grand marshal is dead. The grand marshal is dead, De Rock, but you are mistaken. He was beside me just now. Several aides de camp arrived with a page who brought His Majesty's spyglass. The fatal news was in great part confirmed that Duke de Friol was not yet dead, but his entrails had been struck and all the assistance of art was unavailing. The ball, after hitting the tree, had ricocheted on General Kirchner, who fell dead on the spot, and then upon the Duke de Friol, Messrs. Yvonne and Larry were with the wounded men who had been transported to a house in Makersdorf. There was no hope of saving him. To describe the consternation of the army, the grief of his majesty at this frightful event would be impossible. The emperor mechanically gave some orders. He came back to camp. Arriving in the square of the guard, he sat down on a stool in front of his tent with his head bent down and joined hands and remained thus for nearly an hour without uttering a single word. Yet essential measures must be taken for the next day. General Drouot approached him and in a voice broken by sobs, asked him what was to be done. Time enough for all that tomorrow, replied the emperor. He said not another word. Poor man, muttered the old grumblers of the guard as they looked at him. He has lost one of his children. At nightfall, the enemy was in full retreat, and the army, having taken its positions, the emperor left the camp and went to the house where the grand marshal had been carried, accompanied by 
Prince de Neuchâtel, Monsieur Ivan, and the Duke de Vicenza. The scene was terrible. The disconsolate emperor several times embraced his faithful friend and sought to part some hopes, but the duke, who knew his condition perfectly, only replied by entreating him to have them give him opium. At these words, the emperor went out. He could restrain himself no longer. The Duc de Friol died the next morning. The emperor ordered his body to be taken to Paris and deposited under the dome of the invalid. He bought the house in which the grand marshal died and charged the pastor of the village to have a stone placed on the spot where the bed had stood, on which the following inscription should be engraved. Here, General Duroc, Duke de Friol, Grand Marshal of the Palace of the Emperor Napoleon, struck by a cannonball, died in the arms of the Emperor, his friend. The preservation of this monument was made obligatory on the tenant of the house. This was the condition of the gift of it, which was made him by his majesty, the pastor, the village magistrate, and the donee were summoned for this purpose into his majesty's presence. He made them acquainted with his intentions, which they solemnly pledged themselves to fulfill. Then his majesty, taking the necessary funds from his cash box, remitted them to these gentlemen. It is well now that the reader should know how this agreement, so religiously contracted, received its fulfillment. The following order from the Russian staff office will uh, Prize him. A protocol bearing date March 16th states that the Emperor Napoleon has remitted to Minister of Religion Hermann at Makerstoff the sum of 200 gold Napoleons intended for the erections of a monument to the memory of Marshal Duroc, who died on the field of battle. His Excellency Prince Repnin. Governor General of Saxony, having ordered that a clerk from my office should repair to Makersdorf in order to take possession of the said sum so as to deposit it with me until the final disposition of it shall be decided upon. Clerk Mayerheim is charged with this mission. In consequence, he will instantly present himself at Makersdorf for the purpose of legitimating himself to Minister Hermann by showing him the present order and will seize from his hand the afford said sum of 200 gold Napoleons. Clerk Mayerheim will have no account to give of the execution of this order to anyone but me. Signed, Baron de Rosen at Dresden, this 20th day of March, April 11th, 1814. This document requires no comment. After the battles of Bautzen and Wirtchen, the emperor entered Silesia. Everywhere he saw the combined army of the allies flying before his own and this spectacle deeply flattered his self-love by nourishing the idea that he would soon behold himself master of a rich and fertile country whose abundant resources would be favorable to his enterprises several times a day you would hear him saying are we far from such a city his impatience did not however prevent his occupying himself with whatever attracted his attention as a man might have done who was exempt from all cares when he passed through any village he would examine the houses one after another he noticed the direction of the rivers and mountains and collected even the slightest information that anyone could or would impart in the daytime of may 27th his majesty being between two or three days march from breslau he encountered before a small village called mikelsdorf several regiments of Russian cavalry, which barred the way. They were already quite close to the emperor and the staff, and yet his majesty had not even thought of looking at them. Prince de Neuchâtel, seeing the enemy so near, hastened to the emperor and said, Sire, they keep on advancing. Oh, well, we will advance also, returned his majesty, smiling. Don't you see behind us? And he pointed out the prince of the prince the French infantry, which was approaching in serried columns. A few discharges soon routed the Russians from this position, but they turned up again half a league or a league further away. The thing was always to begin again. The emperor knew this well. Hence, he maneuvered with the greatest precision, directing in person the troops that were moving forward. He went from one acclivity to another and made the round of all the cities and villages to reconnoiter the positions and see what resources he could extract from the soil through his cares as a result of his indefatigable glance the scene would change ten times a day had a column debouched through a sunken road a wood a village it could on the instant take possession of a height for the defense of which a battery was already the emperor indicated all the movements with admirable tact 
so that it was impossible to take him unawares. He commanded only in the mass, transmitting his orders either in person or by his orderly officers to the commanders of corps and divisions who transmitted them in turn or had them transmitted by their own officers to the chiefs of battalion. All the orders given by his majesty were short, precise, and so clear that no explanation of them was ever required. May 29. Not knowing how far on the road to Breslau it would be prudent to advance, His Majesty established himself in a little farmhouse called Rosnig. It had been pillaged already and presented a wretched appearance. There was only one small room in the house with a cabinet for the use of the emperor. Prince de Neuchâtel and his suite took up their quarters as best they could in thatched cabins, barns, and even in the gardens. For there was not shelter enough for all. Fire broke out the next day in a small grange close behind His Majesty's lodging. There were 14 or 15 baggage wagons in this grange, all of which were burned. One of them contained the cash box of the paymaster of the journey. In another were some clothes and linen of the emperor, as well as jewels, rings, snuff boxes, and other costly objects. Very little was rescued from this fire, and if the reserve service had not promptly arrived, his majesty would have been obliged to change his usual toilet customs for lack of stockings and shirts. The Saxon major, Dobelin, who has written very interesting things concerning this campaign, Kane says that everything belonged to his majesty was burned and that some breaches had to be hastily made for him in Breslau. It is an error. I do not think the wardrobe wagon was burned. But even if it had been, the emperor would not have been minus clothing on that account since he had always four or five services either ahead or in the rear of headquarters in Russia where the order was given to burn all the vehicles for which there were no horses. The command was rigorously executed with regard to all the members of his household who had almost nothing left. But for his majesty, everything was kept, which could be regarded as indispensable.